Good evening and welcome. My name is Jorge Ancona and I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Alumni Engagement and Executive Director of the UCR Alumni Association. On behalf of the UCR Alumni Association and the Office of Alumni Engagement, thank you for joining us. This evening's presentation on the UCR Botanic Gardens will be delivered by Dr. Jody Holt. But before I introduce her, let me just uh, cover a couple of items. One, you will notice that uh, this evening's presentation is being recorded, and that is so that we will be able to post this online for uh, future viewing access. We also ask that you please keep yourself on mute so as not to inadvertently distract or interrupt Dr. Holt's presentation. And you will also have the opportunity to ask questions. We ask that you please use the chat feature to submit your questions. You don't have to wait till the end, but we will be covering those questions at the end of the presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker. Dr. Jody Holt has been the director of the UCR Botanic Gardens since 2016, a position she began after retiring from 30 plus years as professor of plant physiology at UCR. During her career at UCR, she has also served as chair of the Department of Botany and Plant Sciences and Divisional Dean of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Her research program focused on ecology and management of invasive exotic weeds in wildlands and agriculture. And she taught graduate and undergraduate courses, including more than 20 years teaching her favorite subject, botany. In her spare time, she has dabbed, or she has dabbled in botanical consulting, most notably for the movie Avatar and related products. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Holt. Well, before I share my screen and start my slides, I would like to say welcome to all of you. I hope you can see me. I'm in the gardens, obviously. Um, this is a huge and diverse audience, and I'm so appreciative that you're all here. It's very gratifying. The one thing we all have in common is UCR, and therefore we all have the UCR Botanic Gardens in common. And so what I'm gonna do this evening for all of you is um, talk a little bit about why it's really impactful and important that UCR has the Botanic Gardens. And then I'll give you a little bit of history and an overview of what the gardens has to offer. And after that, I'm gonna talk about all the activities and um, accomplishments we've made over the years, particularly since I've been director and uh, what happened in 2020, which was like a um, ton of bricks falling on the gardens and how we've navigated 2020 and look forward to the future. So my goal is really for all of you who may not have visited or not have visited recently, is to convince you to love the Botanic Gardens as much as I do and convince you to get involved in whichever way suits you in your current life, okay? So just so you know, the audience includes alumni, UCR faculty and staff and students, parents of students, garden staff, volunteers in the gardens, friends of the Botanic Gardens, and probably other cohorts I don't even remember. Um, but it, this is a really diverse audience. So welcome to everyone and I hope you enjoy the presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so is that working? Okay. So um, the UCR Botanic Gardens, I wanna also point out that I'm gonna have a lot of pictures in my talk. Nearly all of them are from the gardens. Along the top of this slide is one of our rose gardens. Along the lower left is one of our um, iconic plants, an agave, which was used to create our new brand image on the lower right. So on the lower right is our new brand that you'll see a couple of times throughout the talk. So we appreciate UCR Communications helping rebrand us using this iconic plant. So first I want to give you a little perspective about botanic gardens and why they're important and why it's really important that UCR has one. 
Um, botanic gardens are found around the world. There are over 2,000 in countries all over the world. We have five in the UC system. And they're very diverse from their size, their shape, their um, purpose, mission, um, everything about them is very, very diverse. One thing that's really gratifying is that there are several professional organizations that support and aid gardens. And I've listed them here. You'll hear a little bit about more of them later. The first is the American Horticultural Society, which provides benefits to our members that I'll speak about later. The American Public Gardens Association, which has provided valuable resources um, on how to manage and run a garden, and particularly during the pandemic year. They've been just critical in helping us and other gardens stay viable and open. And finally, the Botanic Gardens Conservation International, which is an organization that really um, was designed to support emergent gardens in developing countries and their focus is on conservation. So it's a wonderful organization to help gardens. The pictures I've shown here are just a few from gardens around the world. In the upper right is the giant water lily, which produces the largest leaves in the world. This was collected in the Amazon and named for Queen Victoria. And this is growing in the Kew Gardens in London in this photograph. In the lower right, what you're seeing is a, a South African desert garden in Auckland, New Zealand in their botanic gardens. What I like about this garden was that they even simulated these ant hills, which we're so fortunate not to have where we are. And then in the middle, what you see is a little alpine garden in this little planting in the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. So gardens around the world have many, many different um, focus and themes that are really worth visiting and learning about. So botanic gardens matter. And the reason I'm showing you this is that we have a tremendous resources from the American Public Gardens Association, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the things they provide is data to us to help demonstrate the value of botanic gardens. So of the 600 member gardens in APCA, a survey showed in the year 2016 and 17 that over 121 million people visited gardens, visited just those member gardens. Now for perspective, they added up the number of people that visited or attended all sports events in the US, all professional sports in that same year. And the total was 134 million. So the number of people that visited botanic gardens in that year was nearly the same is the number that went to all sporting events combined, football, basketball, hockey, and baseball. So gardens are really, really important to people for a lot of reasons. Most people visit gardens near home. And if you look at the population within 25 miles of Riverside, it's over 3 million. So we have a huge constituency. And just for a final little piece of data, we have an infrared people counter that we use to log the number of visitors we have. And based on a few months last year before we were closed in March, um, we estimate that we had about 6,500 visitors per month. You can extrapolate to 80,000 a year. It's a staggering number of people that come to UCR to visit our botanic gardens. The pictures here show some of the reasons that people visit botanic gardens. On the right is a sign in another gardens showing that people come to hike and visit and learn about the outdoors. And what you see in this picture in the middle is people coming basically to learn about plants and read signs and learn about plants either in nature or that they might wanna have in their own gardens. And this little picture from another gardens I really like because it shows what a lot of people do when they visit the gardens. They just wanna bring their children to get them outside and let them run around and burn off steam and have a good time in nature. So UCR is so fortunate to have a botanic gardens and our unique, unique status is that we are a public university garden, which brings a lot of benefits to be connected with the university. A botanic garden is not a park. 
So we are actually a curated living plant museum. It's like a museum, only it's outdoors. And we're staffed by professionals. We're open to the campus and the public. So it's a public garden. It's a part of the university and we're governed by all the policies and regulations of the University of California, which is a wonderful resource and um, source of protection for us, really. The gardens are visited for research, education, enjoyment, and basically for people to connect with nature. So the pictures here are just a few from our garden. On the lower right, you see our butterfly garden, which was developed and funded by donors who have a particular love of butterflies. And in the middle, you see our iris garden, which was developed years and years ago and is under renovation right now, but in full bloom, it's quite spectacular. And then on the left, you see one of the resident bobcats that lives in the botanic gardens, because we are actually a certified wildlife habitat as well. And we have a lot of wildlife in the garden. The bobcats are probably the most spectacular and people feel really excited when they see one. Every now and then in the spring, we actually see the kittens. So they do live in the gardens. So I wanna give you just a little bit of history of the garden, not too much, but the gardens were actually established in 1963 by some faculty in the Department of Biology. And what they really needed was a garden on campus in which to grow their research plants so that they could study them and also to be used in teaching. So the gardens were set up just as a research and teaching resource and started from scratch on what is, was at that time open shrublands. So those of you in Riverside know that the Box Springs Mountains around UCR are basically a shrubland. And you can see some of that in this picture on the left. This is a picture of the parking lot and the entrance to the gardens back in the 60s and 70s. And basically most of the land looked like that. It, um, almost everything in the gardens now was planted. The only thing that hasn't changed is our little parking lot, which is pretty much the same size as it was then. But everything else has changed. And the picture on the right shows our entrance today with a lot of new things, new signage, new plantings. So over the five years after 1963, the faculty that um, lobbied the campus administration to start the gardens started to develop the concept of having this be a, a natural botanic gardens on campus. Over the 58 years since then, the gardens have had five directors. All of them were faculty and part-time. So the job of being a director was added to their already um, heavy load as research and teaching faculty. So the person you see near the top, Dr. Frank Vasek, was the person who lobbied for the initial founding of the Botanic Gardens. He was the ecologist in the botany department when I was hired there. The second director was Dr. Um, George Gillett, shown here over to the right. And during his tenure as director, a lot of the infrastructure and buildings in the garden were established. The person you see in the middle here that I'm circling with my cursor is Dr. Lewis Erickson. Dr. Erickson had as his goal to really connect the Botanic Gardens with the community. And he started engaging the Rose Society and garden clubs to come help plant gardens and get involved in the gardens in its um, establishing. The next picture here, Dr. Giles Wayne, somewhere during that time, um, faculty pictures started to be taken in color, luckily. Dr. Waynes was director for um, 30 years, I have actually the date is wrong there, um, but he was director for 30 years. And Dr. Wayne, during his tenure, most of the gardens were established and expanded and he acquired a lot of new plants and laid out a lot of the gardens that we see today. And then I started in 2016 after retiring. So I'm also a part-time faculty, but I'm not burdened with my normal teaching and research responsibilities. So this is my passion project in retirement. I've put a website here. Our gardens website is gardens.ucr.edu. And there's a little bit of history at this link. 
And the last line indicates that the Gardens Walla campus resource is actually in CNAS and administered by CNAS. So we receive the support and benefits of any department in CNAS, which is really um, considerable and we appreciate it very much. So just for an overview, I know some of you in this um, audience are staff of the gardens, visitors, volunteers, members. So you'll know all this, but I'm just for those who are not that familiar with the gardens today, I'm gonna give you a little bit of overview. Um, so you'll get an orientation to what we are. So the gardens is a 40 acre reserve located between UCR and the Box Springs. Our claim to fame is there's very little flat ground, which is challenging. On the other hand, it gives us such a diversity of terrain that there are many, many microclimates, the lettuce grow plants, that really don't grow in other places in Riverside. So we have two arroyos and the gardens start at the lowest elevation at the entrance and rise to about a 350 elevation, 350 foot elevation increase to the southernmost end of the gardens. We have about 300, 3,500 plant species. And at least at one time, there were over 10,000 planted um, accessions, meaning cataloged plants in the gardens. Currently, about a third of the gardens are still unplanted as open space, um, mostly shrublands and grasslands. So there's room to um, expand as permit. The pictures here, um, those of you who are familiar with the gardens probably know right where this upper picture was taken. I was standing in the South African garden and I'm looking at this zigzag paved switchback walkway that goes up towards the greenhouse and the rose gardens. And then the lower picture is just one of the um, pictures of our terrain that's quite rocky in some areas that it's where it's wonderful to hike. So the gardens overall, um, if I wanted to describe them to someone who'd never been there, we have two types of gardens. And one type is what we call our thematic gardens, which are the manicured um, gardens with a focus on a theme such as the ones shown here. The upper right is one of our rose gardens. Um, the lower right is our butterfly garden. We also have an herb garden, iris garden, a lilac garden, a subtropical fruit orchard. We have shade plants in a, basically a shade garden in a dome structure. And the picture right in the middle is our brand new garden that we launched last year. And this is the Native American plants garden, which we're extremely proud of. This was developed in collaboration with students from UCR's Native American students programs. So this is still in the works. Um, we need more signage and we're working on it, but it's been planted and it's really beautiful. So we're very proud of this brand new garden, first in a few years. So the thematic gardens in reality, I think is where most visitors spend their time. And in fact, when I first started as director, I heard a few people say that they didn't know we had anything else. So one of our goals over the last few years has been to really promote and open up and clean up the other group of gardens we have, which we call our eco-geographical gardens. And these are gardens focused around the theme of representing the vegetation in Mediterranean and arid lands around the world. So what we have is a number of gardens representing plant communities in California, where we have a Mediterranean climate and some desert climates. And then we also have gardens that represent other re regions of the world with Mediterranean climates, including the Mediterranean itself, around the Mediterranean Sea, Latin America, Latin America, Australia, and South Africa. So the gardens here, which um, this is probably one of the most popular gardens and most um, special gardens we have in the upper right is our North American Desert Garden. It's just very impactful with many plants, um, a lot to see. People tend to beeline there when they first come to the gardens. But I really wanna promote the rest of the 
eco-geographical gardens. The other picture, the lower picture, is Australia. Where can you go to Australia right now without getting on an airplane? We have a really beautiful Australia garden, and it was the focus last year of intensive cleanup, augmentation with new plantings, some donated by our plant sale vendors. And it is truly um, impactful when you walk up the hill and emerge and feel like you've gone to Australia. So this is a beautiful garden, as are all the others. We also have some special features and they are notable. And I think in a lot of cases, if you're an alumnus that used to visit the garden, you will remember these. So one of the things that everybody seems to know, of course, is Alder Canyon. This starts with our lawn where we have many events and it continues up in Arroyo to our turtle pond shown in the lower right. And most people that come in with children beeline for the turtle pond because they wanna see turtles and fish. We also have many iconic rock formations. I've got a picture of one in the upper right that um, is called actually um, officially pepper rock because the tree behind it, pepper tree, is actually growing out of the rock where it sprouted many decades ago. But when I first started in the gardens, what I learned was that it was also called makeout rock because when the pepper tree has not been pruned, it grows over the rock and creates a nice little secluded place for, a, um, for you to go and sit, and whatever. Um, what you see in the middle is another of our special features, our geodesic dome. And this is probably the most photographed place in the garden. It's extremely popular. Very sadly, it's been closed now because it's um, unsafe, structurally unsound. And one of our new projects is to figure out how to replace it, which I'll mention again later. We also have gazebos, um, arbors, um, benches, many benches, and abundance of wildlife. So there are many things that are special features that people know and come to visit in the gardens. We have a few buildings. So we have some infrastructure as well, and I've just got a few pictures here. Um, we have a gatehouse at the entrance shown here. We were very fortunate to work with campus a couple of years ago and renovate the gatehouse. And now one of the restrooms is legally ADA compliant and up to code. And this is also used for cashiering during some of our events. We have a conference room shown at the lower, in the lower picture. This is where we also have events and some rental events. We have a garage office and equipment yard where the volunteers check in and start their work as well as the staff. We have a laugh house. I'll show you some pictures of that later, a greenhouse. We have a second restroom building. And then in the upper right, we have what we use for our gardens office, the Schneider House office that's off on the Eastern edge of campus in a neighborhood that was annexed to the gardens about um, 35 years ago. So that is a lovely place where we have our offices and some events as well. And of course we have staff, a very small but dedicated, formidable and excellent staff. So I know many of you are on this talk right now. So I wanna introduce the rest of you to our curator, Janine, who's shown right here our program coordinator and administrative assistant, Pam. So if you call on the phone, Pam is the lovely voice on the phone. Our new manager, Miguel, he's a little over a year into the job and has had quite a first year and done really, really well. We have Lois Wide and Jorge Fregosa, our um, nursery technicians, and a passel of students, you see some of them here. And for those of you who have been associated with the gardens for many years, I'm gonna circle Teresa McLemore, our former manager who retired and Miguel replaced her. And then I wanna point out Pam Roos, who is the longest termed employee in the gardens. Pam and I and our spouses came to Riverside at the same time, about 1982 and Pam started working in the gardens and she's still there. So that's a testimony to how wonderful and fun it is to work for the gardens. So this is our small staff 
but we could not maintain this beautiful facility without a lot of support from friends members, some of whom are in the audience, many volunteers, some of whom are in the audience, and a tremendous amount of support from UCR and CNAS and many departments on campus. And I'll be mentioning a lot of them later on. So when I first started as director, I had visited and brought my classes to the gardens for many, many years. But one of the things we felt we needed was a vision statement and a mission statement to really guide the things we were gonna do. So we view ourselves as UCR's living museum and we're curated to inspire and facilitate education, research and interpretation of the natural world. Our mission, where everything we do focuses on, is to be the focal point for campus and community engagement in the science of nature, gardens, and conservation. We are the botanic gardens for the Inland Empire, and we want to be that, and we want to be there for you. So when you think of visiting a garden, we want to be the one you think of. And in a nutshell, really, our purpose is to create a sense of place at UCR, where you want to come, be outdoors, experience, learn, and protect nature. So what you see in the upper picture is just one of the glorious pictures of the South African garden when it's in bloom, all the more reason to visit in the spring. And the picture in the, bo the bottom shows a group of staff and volunteers ready to welcome you to one of our many events. This was pre-COVID. So any pictures where people are standing together without masks are pre-2000. So right after I started and some of the staff were new, we realized that in order to create um, a sense of place and to engage people more in the gardens, what we really had to do was to start launching a program of putting in signs, maps, trail markers, because there really wasn't much of that when I first started. And so um, one of the first things we did to work with was to work with campus communication to create this beautiful brand for the Botanic Gardens, which we try to put on everything we can. Um, another volunteer produced for us this wonderful LIDAR map, which is even more accurate than satellite. It's shown on our new message board here on the lower right. Another volunteer and consultant produced for us an interactive map using GIS, where you can tour yourself through the gardens and know where you are. Another volunteer, um, produced redwood signs for all of our gardens, which are now labeled, and also numbered waypoints shown here that correspond to numbers on the map. So you'll never need to get lost again. We brought in more Wi-Fi, um, launched a new website with a lot of support from campus, and installed a new people counter, an infrared people counter, which is how we're trying to figure out what our impact really is on the community. And we accomplished a lot in the first four years of when I started and some of the staff were new, we were going great guns to really redo a lot of our organizational structure, develop a new operating model, develop partnerships with campus. Um, a lot of the laws and policies had changed on campus over the, the decades the gardens had been in operation. So we wanted to bring everything into financial compliance and work on budgeting, stop losing money. So we restructured all of our events, our membership program, our development and fundraising, um, started a lot of deferred maintenance, launched a PR campaign, lots of things. And these pictures represent some of those things in the upper right. You can see some cashiering from a plant sale um, with a campus cashier, an official um, certified cashier and a volunteer who's trained to help. On the lower right, you see a student club we brought in and trying to engage more students in our events. And then what you see in the small picture is some of the branded items that we now sell, um, not to make a lot of money, but to really get our image and our brand out in the community so people know we're here and they, they should visit. And then 2020 happened to all of us. Um, what a surprise, we had spent four years redoing all operations and suddenly we had a do-over moment. So the gardens and UCR closed in March of 2020. Everything went remote, classes, research, staff, work, 
the gardens were closed. Um, I could spend another hour talking about the impact, but I won't do that because I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. What I will tell you is that with a huge amount of support from the American Public Gardens Association, from campus all the way up to the chancellor and campus council, from the COVID committees and the med school, the county, the state, um, we were able to reopen. We were able to slowly bring back our staff, our students, our volunteers to recover what was lost during three months of, um, of closure. Because as any of you know that have a garden, you can't let a garden go without constant maintenance. So towards the end of June, right around July 1st, we reopened with safety restrictions for COVID. Currently, because we need to have someone at the gate at all times, we're not open from eight to five, seven days a week as we used to be. We're open weekdays in the mornings. We're open first and third Sundays in the mornings. As we're able to bring on more um, volunteers to stay at the gate, we'll expand our hours. But right now, people are very grateful that they can visit in the mornings. So we have gate attendance at all times, mask, physical distancing, no in-person activities, no groups, um, no gatherings, but the gardens are still available for a visit. And I've put our website here, which is gardens.ucr.edu slash information. So um, throughout my talk, I'm adding a lot of links to show you just where you can find out more about how to visit and what you'll find. So these pictures just show um, some of the signage we changed out, of course, for safety during COVID. And there I am wearing all the branded swag I can during one of our online um, with in-person pickup plant sales. And in the lower picture, you see a volunteer who is staffing the gate. So this is what you'll encounter when you visit now, um, a staff or a volunteer steward at the gate telling you what the policies are with a little hand sanitizer making sure you know that we're going to ensure your safety while you visit. So what I'm going to do now is step back a little bit from 2020 and give you an overview of what we do as the Botanic Gardens. Um, again, we're not a park. We have a mission. We have a collection. We're a museum. So I'm going to talk about what our functions are and our activities are and then how we're able to um, navigate those in 2020 and 2021 and beyond. So as a botanic garden, our primary function is to maintain a curated collection like any museum does. And so Janine, our curator is in charge of this and to manage a collection, what that means is you acquire plants, you make sure they all have labels with the official information on the labels so our visitors can learn about them. We have an online database, so we can um, look up and people can find out what plants we have and share with other gardens. That's all part of managing a curated collection. And the plants are planted out in gardens, of course. So we maintain our thematic and geographical gardens. We have a propagation facility for plants shown in this lower picture here. This is called the Little White House because this is where a lot of the propagation starts and then the plants are moved out into the lath house. We have a greenhouse for part of our collection. It houses some of the teaching collection for botany as well. Um, the dome houses part of the collection. And then the picture in the lower right is a part of our greenhouse showing a new project that we're very excited about. And this is a new conservatory. So the front of the greenhouse is being converted into a conservatory that will house part of the collection that is arranged in a display to educate about plant evolution and plants of economic value. So this is coming on board. We'll be launching this this year as well. Well, when everything came to a screeching halt in 2020, um, fortunately, a lot of the collection management could be done remotely or with occasional visits to the garden. The thing that really can't be done remotely that everybody recognized all over campus is maintaining the gardens and facilities. So after a few weeks of um, sort of wringing our hands over weeds and 
all the things that happen when you're not maintaining. We brought back essential staff. We brought back essential volunteers. And we once again started working on critical functions to keep the gardens going. So we'd have a gardens to come back to. So what you see in these pictures in the lower left is one of our volunteers working in the Rose Garden and picking up glitter and keeping things clean and tidy. What you see in the middle picture here is one of our staff and a volunteer um, with a truckload of weeds and pruning that they're bringing in, wearing masks and staying remote from each other. What you see in the lower right is another staff member, Lois, propagating, maintaining the plants and pots for an upcoming plant sale in the Laugh House on campus. And what you see in the upper picture is two volunteers continuing a little bit of propagation. So we'll have plants to put out in the gardens and to sell. And again, they're working with masks, staying their distance. The wonderful thing about working in the gardens is everybody's outdoors. And so it's inherently safer than most other jobs. So we've been able to keep a lot of this going. So pre-2020, the gardens engaged in many, many activities to engage people in coming and visiting both campus community and the local community. So the gardens has a very well-developed educational program that predates me by many years. And we have a program where docents are trained and they lead school tours. So we actually tour thousands of school kids through the gardens every year. They're docent, volunteer docent led tours that um, provide um, curriculum from the statewide environmental education curriculum. Our docents also lead adult tours. We have UCR and RCC classes and labs that come to the gardens. And the upper right is a picture of a UCR class pre-COVID coming to visit and do their field trip in the gardens. And we have quite a few UCR researchers that use the garden, people that work on hummingbirds, plants, a lot of environmental sciences. We've had a class studying earthquakes, doing work in the gardens. I mean, a lot of research goes on as well. We also have a lot of activities for outreach, which is in my view, sort of education outside the classroom that brings the public in to educational activities. The picture on the lower right shows one of our very popular garden market and plant sales that went on for several decades um, before 2020 and that we've sort of revamped going forward. We have workshops. This picture in the middle on the bottom shows last year's um, rose pruning workshop where the public is invited to come watch and learn how to prune roses. We have bird walks led by um, expert birders who happen to be faculty on the UCR campus. We have twilight tours that are led by docents and volunteers, extremely popular. They sell out. We do those in summer evenings after hours. Um, so a lot of different activities to bring people in to the gardens, encourage them to visit and, um, and come back and join and get involved. So when all of that came to a halt in 2020, uh, we really couldn't do anything in person. And so um, because we had already started some um, online activities, we quickly turned to launch a lot more of those. So in the area of education, one of the first things we did was to build on our interactive GIS map. And Janine, um, having taken a class in how to use um, GIS, started developing GIS story maps. And what I want to tell all of you is if you've never um, discovered a GIS story map, please go to this link on our website right here, gardens.ucr.edu, virtual tours. So you go to tours, virtual tours, because what we are working on this year is putting as many of our in-person tours as possible online. And a story map is actually an interactive way that you can take a tour sitting at home in your jammies or while you're walking around in the gardens with your smartphone. They're really impactful. So we have several of these now on our website. They're just wonderful. One was built from the botany class that I used to teach, Field Trip. 
And it was built from that. And now the students can actually do their field trip using our story map. Um, we are also working with the volunteer videography team that we greatly appreciate. And they are now video recording some of the docent led tours. And we're gonna put those on our website. We've had another volunteer take a video of a field lab for a botany class, and that was made available to the students. So with all the technology we have, we're doing as many of these tours and educational things as we can, can online and they're on our website. In this picture on the upper right, what you see is the first safe class field trip that came back to the gardens in 2020. And this is a biology class, a field class that we opened for when we were closed to the public. And they came in, students wore masks and stayed their distance and they were able to do their field trip safely. In terms of all the outreach that just came to a grinding halt, um, we are so appreciative to our campus partners who helped us launch an online storefront and last summer, we were able to hold our very first online plant sale. Here's one of the posters. And after purchasing online, our um, clientele who bought plants came for in-person pickups. And so what you see in this lower picture is volunteers helping assemble the orders in our wheelbarrows. And when you drive up to get your plants, the volunteer would run out, put them in the trunk of your car and off you would go. So this was approved and it was safe and allowed us to continue selling plants to people that really love to come um, purchase our plants to put in their own home gardens. I'll do a little advertising right now. We're having our next online plant sale this spring, April 10th through 11th. So if you um, stay in touch using this website, you can um, be the first to know when we start rolling out information and links to this plant sale. We also, um, with volunteer help, of course, volunteers did this. We had our first workshop virtually this fall. We, our volunteers ran a succulent holiday wreath workshop for us. And this little picture at the top is a wreath that was made in this workshop. And it was so successful, we'll probably continue doing some of these even when we're able to open and do activities in person. So all of these things are ways of continuing to offer education and educational outreach and connect our visitors with the gardens and with UCR. So another of our core functions, of course, is fundraising because we raise half of our budget we normally have fundraisers every year, such as Primavera in the Gardens. You see this picture on the upper right, um, Art in the Gardens. There's our postcard from the last Art in the Gardens. We have campaigns. We raise funds through gifts and endowments. Now I've put the giving link there. We have friends memberships. We have a lot of earned revenue from plant sales, renting our conference room, educational events, this picture in the middle is our little pop-up garden shop that we hold sometimes when we have an event. So these are all ways that we supplement the funding that we do get from CNAS. So we raise about half of our budget. And of course, in 2020, everything came to a halt. All revenue streams stopped. And so we had to, to figure out what to do instead. Um, we were quite sad about Primavera because what I'm pointing out here is Last year, in 2019, we commissioned a brand new logo for Primavera and it's beautiful and we can't wait to launch it. So what we hope to do this year is either hold Primavera safely or have a virtual event where we can use this new logo and bring people back to the event that they've loved for over 20 years. Um, our development partners on campus in CNAS that we so appreciate helped us this year launch a Giving Tuesday campaign. You can see in this little poster on the bottom, we had a year-end campaign to raise funds for our endowment. And all of that will help us stay um, financially solvent, solvent into the future. We ramped up PR. We have a new e-news newsletter that the campus sends out for us every month. We're on social media. UCR Communications includes the gardens in every way they can. 
And we post all those things on the news site shown here on our website. So campus really has been great to promote the gardens in inside UCR, UCR uh, magazines, all kinds of things. We've been promoting our friends membership and the link for that is here. With help from campus, we also launched more online activities this year, which were really wonderful. Um, instead of having to carry a little cash if you wanna donate when you visit, we have an online gate donations now. And I am working with our transportation and parking department to bundle these admission donations with reduced parking and hopefully expand our parking in the next couple of years. So that's a big one. I hope to have more to say about in the future. And we finally, in our core functions, I want to mention, <coughs> excuse me, our volunteer program. Because I keep saying we, and what I mean is our staff and volunteers. The staff are small. Um, they do a fabulous job, but none of these things that I'm talking about could be done without the help of volunteers as well. Our volunteers come from campus and the community. We have over 250 onboarded volunteers that work everywhere from weekly to annually at certain events. We, before COVID, we had twice monthly walk-in orientations and we were gaining a lot of student volunteers from those. Um, one of our updates was to have one day onboarding, many areas of need, and these are pictures of just some of the things the volunteers helped us with before um, 2020. And a volunteer appreciation luncheon shown here. So in the last year, um, we were able to bring back volunteers by invitation and to make things a little more safe. What we did was to launch an online management program for our volunteers, the training and a daily COVID survey before they come to campus. All the scheduling and reporting is done online. Volunteers help staff the gates. They keep the gardens beautiful. The upper picture is this year's rose pruning, which was very scaled down. We had a group of master gardeners come and help us do pruning and they knew what to do. They're wearing masks and staying distant and got our roses pruned. Here we see on the bottom right, volunteers helping with online plant sales pickup. Um, lots and lots of things volunteers do. And instead of our volunteer luncheon, which we couldn't have, we had a virtual volunteer appreciation event with these little thank you bags full of goodies this year. So we look forward to more in-person activities as the year progresses. So we also made a lot of lemonade out of lemons this year. I just wanna point out some of the things we were able to do when we didn't have visitors. With campus help, we were able to repave our road. Um, Miguel's team re, um, restored and upgraded and maintained a lot of our trails where we have signs saying what you're gonna encounter. We worked to improve parking did a lot of landscape maintenance, tree pruning and removal. Um, the team is working to improve Alder Canyon lawn care to bring in drip irrigation. So a lot of infrastructure was possible. Um, and we just took advantage of the downtime to get this done. So for the coming year, um, scaling down a little, we have some immediate goals as we watch the year unfold. We wanna complete our conservatory um, roll it out. We need to figure out how to replace this beautiful structure here. This dome was built um, in the 80s. People don't build domes anymore. It is certainly not seismically sound, but we need to replace it. We're working on that. And we want to launch a program to install more interpretive signage. Um, in the engagement area, we continue to provide a safe and secure nature oasis for our visitors. We're continuing to launch online and virtual experiences and particularly wanna help contribute to the UCR teaching mission as classes stay remote and start to come back online. We have a perfect space for doing things outdoors. We're also gonna launch a membership drive this year and I wanna just tell you why we want you to be a friend. Um, the friends, Membership program has a level for every interest, students, individuals, families on up. 
We are getting ready to roll out a 10% discount for UCR, UCR faculty and staff coming soon. And there are many benefits to membership, which are listed here. One of the most important benefits is one I've shown with this little decal on the upper right. As a member of the American Horticultural Society, we as a member garden offer all of our members reciprocal admissions benefits to all member gardens. So as a member of our garden, you can visit over 320 gardens around the country free or greatly discounted. This is really one of the benefits I think that has been sort of under the radar, but whenever we travel, I go to every garden I can find, flash my membership card in our gardens and I get in free. And it's just a special membership club where you are a part of this network of gardens around the country. We also launched our first um, special events, a catered dinner here for our higher level members. So we really want to promote membership this year, especially to campus, because it's a way of making sure that everybody on campus, parents of students on campus, alumni know that we are your Botanic Garden and there are many benefits to getting involved and visiting and joining the Friends of the Garden. So our long-term goal, this is an aspirational goal, probably not in my lifetime, is to have a whole new entrance to the gardens and really connect with campus through this building where it would be between the gardens and campus. It would be a science center for CNAS and have everything from a museum to teaching space, food, restrooms, and parking, which we desperately need. It would really connect us more strongly to campus allow us to really launch more educational activities to support the teaching mission of UCR. So this has been supported all the way up to the level of the chancellor. So we have our sights on a very long-term goal as well. So how to get involved. We really want all of you to know that as people who are all connected to UCR, we are your botanic gardens. This is your garden. So you can visit, you can participate in events, you can join, you can volunteer, you can support, or all of these. We are here to be your place to get out safely in nature, have a respite, especially from 2020 and 2021, um, and come see us and learn more about the gardens. So we do look forward to 2021 and beyond. Stay safe, wear a mask, keep your distance, and thank you very much for coming and participating this evening. Dr. Holt, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and uh, an overview. And I love that you even have Bernie Sanders right there near the volunteer gate. <laughs> With his Purell and his mask. So. <laughs> yes, I see that. So uh, no, thank you so much. I know you mentioned um, several um, ways people can, can volunteer and, and whether you have a brown thumb and, and it's more about being a docent and talking about the plant life or about different ways to engage. I was wondering right now, it, it, I saw in your slide that um, some of the volunteers um, opportunities at the moment are by invitation only. And I'm assuming because of the limited hours that you're currently keeping at the Botanic Garden. So. When do you anticipate um, starting to open up additional volunteer opportunities for those who were attent attentively listening and maybe wanting to get involved with the garden in the future? Thank you very much, because you're right. There was sort of a disconnect between those slides and what I said. So um, during the closure and my work to reopen, we were very careful to follow all policies and procedures and it was challenging to justify bringing staff back when campus was closed. And, and we have a, a core of volunteers that are horticultural volunteers who've been here for years. And so um, with, with approval, we invited them back because it, it wasn't, and it probably still isn't a time to orient and train brand new people who have never volunteered. Um, because we just, I take very seriously that it's our responsibility to keep staff, volunteers, and visitors safe. So I'm saying I'm thinking that um, campus is going to go is going to try to have in-person classes in the fall. So I'm thinking um, even today the governor um, 
lessened our lockdown. So I'm thinking over the summer and certainly by fall, we will probably start to be able to have orientations and invite people back. We have brought in a few new volunteers during this time, however, because the only way we could reopen is to have stewards at the gate. And so um, people have been referred to us or asked if they could volunteer and I interview them and ask, you know, basically what are their um, experiences because we're really trying to reduce risk. So we haven't brought student volunteers in. You know, we're, we're trying to bring piece of people who are a little more seasoned, who could handle this and feel safe. Um, so if you're adamant about coming, contact me and we will talk. Otherwise, I'd say summer on into fall is when we'll start opening it up a little bit. Great, thank you so much for that. So in, in addition to um, you know, having students come through the garden, uh, possibly because a class requires that they do some um, field research, um, how else do you have you, um, in your time as a director, notice how um, the, the typical UCR student um, is engaging with the garden? You know, this is an area I've been focusing on a lot because um, our people counter suggests that we might have 80,000 people a year. And I would say the majority are from the community and from grade schools in the community. And so I've been pondering UCR students um, and we've been making a lot of connections. So here's my observation. Um, I see students coming in during the day, pre-2020, between classes. Um, I talked to a student one day who looked like he was stumbling along. He'd just come out of an exam. I mean, students catch a break between classes. They'll come in and just walk up and sit on a rock or they'll meet their friends or they'll walk around. So we have students doing that. We have a lot of students coming with parents. I think a lot of the parents, they, the parents visit on Mother's Day, Father's Day, commencement and homecoming. Students don't know what to do with parents. They bring them to the gardens. Um, so we see a lot of family groups coming during those events. We also have a lot of groups coming um, for photography, for commencement, um, just wanting to bring their families. They'll come in their cap and gown, take pictures. And so really students, students tend to know about it and come for those reasons. You know, it's, and it's amazing how often you see a student just sitting on a rock somewhere because they'll want to get up there and just sort of zone out for a while. So we're, we're trying to make more connections. We've engaged more with the student clubs. Um, we've started having a table at the Wednesday Nooner events, which of course came to a halt last year, but we're going to resume that. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's sad if students get to year four and don't even know we're there. So that's one of our goals. Thank you. I have time for one last question and uh, that was also submitted. And the question is, um, I know you mentioned the conservatory, but uh, in addition to that, is there a special project that you're looking forward to either launching or completing once you're able to be fully open again and engaging with, with uh, folks and uh, you know, the public in general? Um. You know, I it's I gotta say Alder Canyon looks beautiful because we haven't destroyed the lawn with our events, but we all miss Primavera a lot. And in fact, many of our sponsors and visitors to Primavera have just donated what they would have given because they they want to support the garden, they miss it, they want it to come back. So I'm excited about having Primavera come back. Um and we love having plant sales because we love having people come in and in interacting with them. So the online plant sales have been great, but getting our community of garden lovers and gardeners to come in, um, those are the things I think we all look forward to doing again in person. So the online is great. We're gonna do as much as we can, but I, you know, I'm looking forward to the fall and everybody get a shot. Let's, let's come back and do it in person. Oh, that's what a, what a wonderful way to end. And, and uh, yeah, that was my introduction to the Botanic Gardens was uh, attending my, my very first Primavera, my first year at UCR. So it was just a wonderful Excellent. introduction. Excellent. So, so with that, uh, again, a very special thank you to Dr. Jody Holt for that wonderful presentation. And to each of you, 
Um, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We hope that you found the presentation both informative and enjoyable. And we hope that you join us for one of our upcoming events. The information is located on your screen. Um, and if uh, not, you can always visit us um, at um, alumni.ucr.edu for more information. With that, I wish you all a very good evening and I hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of your, of your time. Thank you so much.